okay. So welcome everyone. Uh, today we'll be covering today myself, Nishant, Phil, GB, and Noah. We all will be covering details about portfolio tools. Uh, things you can expect from this workshop uh, is to learn more about what is a portfolio, how to build one, how to start thinking about it, what to include in it, uh, depending on your expertise, what are the different kind of tools you have at your exposure. Uh, so it's all those kind of details. Um, so the first thing I would like to start with is answering what is a portfolio. Uh, portfolios can come in many shape for especially for UX designers. Portfolio is something that you you will use as a first destination for anyone to see your work because it's online, it's available to everyone, it will be available to the audience that you are targeting that can be your friends, your recruiters, your industry folks or other designers who are interested in seeing your work. So it is one single place that is accessible to anyone. So it's important to keep it up to date. It is important to keep it clean, nice, and something that would represent your digital persona. Because uh, you cannot physically go and talk to everyone, but what you present online is when you when when someone comes to your website and what they see, like the kind of projects you have done, the kind of messages you have, the kind of information you want to present, it, it actually transcends to your digital persona and then they try to understand what kind of person or what kind of designer you are from the work you present over there. Uh, the last thing I would like to mention is it is, use it as a as a place to keep a track of all the projects because eventually you will have projects that you might have done years ago, might be projects that are ongoing, might have projects that you are interested in. It can also have a variety of projects in different domains like it can be a service design project, or a graphic design project, or UI project, or a research or design project. So it can be different types of projects and you can use this as a tool to keep a track of everything where you know what process you went through, what you did in it. Uh, so that's all. Um, next question is, when to start making a portfolio? Uh, has anyone started yet? <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I would say start now. Uh, but you don't have to like you don't have to make a persona like an entire portfolio right now in one go. It is a step by step process, and you can do small bits of work eventually to reach a stage where you have your portfolio ready. And those steps can be first is to just start thinking about what you want to have on your portfolio if you don't have it yet. So it can be as simple as oh, in the about me section, I want to write this kind of things for myself or on the landing page it will be cool to have some kind of digital representation of myself so it's more about start planning for it you don't need to like take action on it right now but just start start planning for it the second is check the existing portfolios uh, there are tons and tons of portfolios online for designers all kind of designers online you just look it up google it up there are so many universities go to their websites check out their students their portfolios and just try to see what they are doing what are the current trends like what are the design strategies they are using what is a better fit for you uh, a simple grid format or a full length format what do you like what do you resonate with try to take ideas from everywhere uh, the third point will be start thinking about your structure. So once you know what you want to put on it, uh, once you see what others are doing, try to apply those structures to what you want to uh, put on your portfolio. So first you thought like, oh, in the about me section, I want a, a brief paragraph about me. Then on the existing portfolios, you saw various ways people are putting that paragraph on. Then you decide like what kind of paragraph fits well for you. And similarly, uh, as you go through this step by step, eventually you will reach a stage where you have a good structure and plan ready to build your portfolio. So by the end of semester, it, it should not be a situation where the December is up and now you have 20 days, I want to come up with my portfolio and then you start like 20 day hackathon. Um, so next I will hand it over to GB uh, to cover the structure of uh, the portfolio website. 
to go off that, um, I would suggest to just like structure a portfolio before like everything before you can actually put content in it. Um, I know some people made their portfolio like before October without any content so that they could just put in the content as soon as possible. That's another way. So I'm going to talk about how to structure your UX or HCI portfolio. Um, like people are probably applying to like UX design, product design, UX research, or like UX engineer or even software engineering. So it's, it's, it might be just like a little bit generic sometimes or um, it might not really fit to research that what I'm talking about, but um, here it is. So the outline is the first step is like build a website, not a PDF. Um, PDF works too, but um, website, I'm going to talk about what you can do more with the website. Um, have clear navigation components and links. List best or recent projects first, or organize them by categories efficiently. What's good to have inside each project pieces? These are probably what um, the most important information is. Um, tell a story of who you are, like how you're going to package yourself as, I'm a designer, but there's so many types of designers. Like what kind of designer are you? What kind of background you have? So that like you have a story to tell. Because one of the most common, and you'll be asked this question all the time, is like explain about yourself, and that's when you can explain. And attractive visual design matters. Um, although like people say UX is not visual, UX actually embraces visual. Um, you have to ha have at least some kind of visual skills, and having like portfolio to have a good visual sense is, is important. And actively upload works and places and showcase your design um, in other places like Dribble, Behance, and um, thoughts in like Medium or something. So the first step, okay, the videos are not working, but these are prototypes, um, GIF images. Um, so website allows you to actually um, build inter like embed interactive prototypes. For example, like you can do iframes of your actual prototype, or you can like put videos. So it's, you can do actually more things than having a PDF document because it's static. And the second thing is, um, I did this in the very early phase, and I know a lot of people do this, um, is to have like a Google tracking code. Uh, it's just like a simple line of code you embed as a JavaScript, right, or something like that. And then um, you just see it, and then um, I keep track of it every single week. Um, you know, it's like it's like a second like information where um, there's this project that I uh, that I really want to explain, but people visit it for like five seconds and opt out. Like, what's the problem? Like, how do I make it more? Um, how do I make it so that people stay more lot longer? And you know, like, what kind of pages are they looking at? What kind of projects are you know, capturing the attention, and these are some of the companies that you know visit your website. Some people like have networks, so you can actually see um, like before the interviews or when you actually apply, so you can keep track of. So, second thing, have clear navigation components. So, um, you know, obviously you have portfolio about you know resume or some some other things to link, um, like LinkedIn, Dribble, Twitter, or whatever. But like having those things are important. Like when you have. You know, when you have a responsive thing, like when you're looking at the mobile, you probably have like hamburger button or you don't have to. Like you have to think about those, you know, you're applying for UX role, right? Um, so having like a good CTA button, also like back button, when, when the content is too long, you should have like a, like a left side column to indicate, you know, people to go somewhere or have like a top button that scrolls up or you can even have like projects at the very end of your and at the, at the end of each project so that people don't have to go back and forth. Um, this best or recent projects first to organize them by categories. So basically you can actually organize them like however you want. It could be by recently or it could, you could actually divide sections into like feature projects or like something so that people can look at it first or it's their best project. Um, you can actually, you know, list it by companies you work with or um, clients or you can actually do like design or like you know, like UX, UX process or like visual design and like research. So you can do something like that. Um, but yeah. So the most important thing, uh, I'm just going to read off these. This is really important. Um, I know people might have different opinions, but um, these are some of the things that I discovered by looking at other people's portfolios. Um, so overview section of your portfolio piece, um, what, what it should have. It should have like the purpose of your projects, like what was the objective, like why did you start on this project? Um, and the team and the individual, like, you could have, like, so what were you trying to solve? Uh, what were some of the final deliverables? So you can have, like, snapshots of the final products so that people don't have to scroll all the way down to see the UI design. Um, also, um, indicate your role in the team. That's really important, um, especially when you do interviews or other things. 
And also, like, the approach you took, like, what are some of the things that you did, like research or something like that, like a brief description that you actually did the UX process. Um, like, how long was the project so that people have a sense that it's a class project? Or, um, like, what was the approximate date? Because sometimes people ask, like, is this a recent project or is this, like, a project from, like, two years before? Um, I mentioned, like, group members. Like, some of the inf I put, like, LinkedIn or um, information so that, you know, they can maybe try to try to find more candidates or something like that. Um, it's more legit, I guess. And um, I mentioned the role in the team. Um, related links, so you can actually put like app download link or like link to prototype, link to posters, like GitHubs or images or something like that. And I said final product showcase, you can have pictures or videos, like really quick snapshots. Next thing is the main content. Um, so since it's like a UX portfolio, um, I know, I know a lot of people just put visual things, um, but I feel like there should at least be some kind of text explaining your thought process. And sometimes it's not just like putting wireframes, you're done with the UX process. You have to explain why you did that. And after, you, after doing the wireframes, what you learned, did you actually do the testing or something like that? So research process has a lot of things that like you're probably learning right now as first year students, like literature reviews, competitive analysis, interviews, surveys. Like you can, like you can include those. Um, and you don't like when you're, for example, interviewing for UX design, you can just quickly skip those. But um, ideation phase, you can have like affinity diagram exercising, brainstorming, and something like customer journey and persona, wireframings, quick sketches, um, example of iterated or final UI designs or some other designs, uh, and functional prototype. Um, these are probably like most common things. And some of the extra things are maybe like if you if you actually won awards or like conference went to conferences with those projects, it's something to sell that you actually worked really hard on that project. Um, so that's something you should you could include. And some of the conclusion or next steps, like people have like conclusion at the end. Oh, the next step I'm going to take is something something something. Even if you're not going to take that, um, like you have those ideas on what the project is going to be like or like the business aspects. Oh, just one thing. Oh yeah. Um, one. Additional thing in that is about NDAs. So a lot of time you will do projects that will include NDAs. Um, it might be with industry, it might be with some labs that don't want their ideas or project you're working on, some information should not be like available, made available publicly. So in those cases, be very uh, like uh, informed about it, like what you can put on your portfolio and what you cannot. Because there have been situations before, like shared by our professors, where they got a legal notice and then they had to take the entire website down. Uh, so those things happen. So if you have signed an NDA with a specific for a specific project with specific uh, stakeholder, just tell them to mention what exactly is under NDA and what exactly you cannot make public, so that you make sure that those things are not made public on your website. Yeah, and for like design internships, typically the products sometimes are not launched, um, so you might have to like wait for that too. But yeah. Sometimes they'll let you do like even if it's just like concepts that weren't used. Mm -hmm. just, yeah. But it's always good to ask the manager. Like, so yeah. especially when so generally it is about so there are two things. One is putting on a portfolio, and second is talking about it. So if you are going through an interview round, and if you're talking about that project. So again, uh, be informed about what exactly you can say and what you can't, because even the companies know that things sometimes you work are like confidential and it's okay for them to, you cannot share, but share your experience. Uh, don't uh, limit yourself in terms of if I cannot say what exactly I did or present what exactly I did, uh, you cannot tell them how was your, uh, like what exactly you did. You can speak in terms of your experience, like what did you learn? Uh, 
uh, what was new to you, what was challenging, and just pick it up of that, and they, they will understand. And be careful of recruiters asking you for um, some of the designs that you actually did, because, like, I know Palantir's recruiters, like, ask you, like, at least show some of your designs that you did, but, like, don't be tempted when people say that. And the additional tips and suggestions, um, these are just additional tips that you might be interested in hearing. It's just like include high resolution images. Some people have images that are low res resolution. It's really hard to read the text. And sometimes like make, make, the, make the images large enough to, so that people can see, um, but make, don't make it too large. Um, add GIFs or interactive photo types. I mentioned this already. Um, this, describe transition from one step. I already mentioned this. Um, include some of the constraints and obstacles during the project. Um, people know it's a class project, and people know, for example, like HCI program, a lot of people want to be UX designers. And if you're four people forming a team, everyone wants to design. And sometimes, um, you know, like there's there's situations where you want to design something, but other person's like, oh, I want to design. So th you have to actually work out those things. And so, like other other constraints could be like like user testing, or you know, there's so many constraints that we faced, anyways. Um, some people actually um, ask you to explain that in the interviews, so you might have to. You might. It's a good idea to take notes of that before going into interview. Um, avoid having too much text, but also avoid having too little text. Um, yeah. So like just enough so that people can see. Um, I I personally write a lot because I want to remember what I did in the past. For example, like I can't really remember what I did last year, so if I looked at the projects I did, I can suddenly remember. But if I don't have that documentation, I can't. Um, you could even have two versions, like one for just pictures and then one for case studies. It really depends on how you want to structure it and try to find inspirations. There's a lot of websites that I shall not mention. You can actually look at it. So tell a story of who you are. Um, the left picture is a picture of Nishan's landing page. Like he really tells a story of how he understands all these UX things and like it really, it really tells a story that he does projects on like um, UX by the UX process. So like you can actually design the landing page however you want. Um, some people have like, hi, I'm my name is something. I go to school in something with a degree, and previously I interned at somewhere. So that people can get the snap snapshot of what, who you are, and you can even explain more about it in the about me section. But some of the things that you can say is like, what is it that you, what is it that's unique about me from the rest of the applicants? Everyone has UX portfolio. Everyone has resume. Like, what, what's your background? So specifically, like, different. It's different from you know making you a more unique candidate. Um, how did I get into UX? This is really important. People ask you all the time. Um, what kind of skills do you have? You know, you can actually state it in this resume, but you can actually show this in your portfolio. Um, what are my interests and passion? Um, does, does it really line up with the job, or am I a good candidate? Um, typically, like, passion is often louder than words. I mean, louder than action. So, um, like, people say, like, every time, I'm a passionate designer, but if you don't really have anything to show, then it's just, you're, it's just, you know, like, you, you, don't, you don't actually have anything to show. Um, how can I relate my previous experience and projects to it? Um, what do I lack in terms of skills? Like, having a self-awareness is really important. Like you can't be expected to know everything. You're just a student. Um, so you have to admit that you're still learning something um, and all the time. Like interviews, you'll be asked a lot of this. Attractive visual design matters. There's so many inspirations on Pinterest, Dribbble, Behance, or other places. Um, you could even like see like what the, what the layout they use, typography, icons, colors, like CTA buttons, like where it goes, uh, images. Um, I mean, like, there's a lot of plugins. Like, there's I know there's a plugin for font when you actually can see which fonts they used in the website. Um, if you have fonts that look really nice, like, you don't really have to invent your own. You could actually adapt it and maybe change it. Seven is actively upload work some places to showcase your designs and thoughts and provide links to them. So people, like, a lot of people link LinkedIn. Um, but other than that, you can actually link, like, Dribbble, Behance, Medium for your articles, GitHub if you did like side projects, um, CodePen, or like you can even showcase project videos on YouTube. Um, and just actively do these because um, like like I said, everyone has the same thing, resume and portfolio. Um, sometimes, like I mentioned, if you're doing a project and you typically, maybe if you're applying for a design role, but you did this really good project, but you are more of a, like a research and overall, all, 
like all over the place, but you didn't really design the app. Like how can I? Sh how can you show your visual skills? Like that's when I actually went out to Dribble, started uploading my things, so that even if I can't show everything about the project, um, I can still show my visual skills as well as the prototyping skills. And also, I share my thoughts in Medium, which is just based on my experience. Um, that's not too bad. All right. Um, so, you know, you have a structure, you have a plan. Uh, how do you actually go about making a portfolio, getting something out there? Um, so, step one. I guess I'll cover this. Um, Step one, first thing you want to do is go buy a domain. Um, domains, if you're not into the whole web thing, I mean, I bet most of you are, but still. Um, domains are like, you know, www.yourname.com or whatever. Um, there are lots of places to get them. Uh, two good ones are Namecheap and Hover. Um, sometimes domains can get really expensive. Um, if you're lucky and your name isn't super common, um, you can get just yourname.com. Really great. Um, buy it now or try to buy it early. Um, the shorter a domain, the better. So rather than have something that's easily remembered or easily typed, um, as well. And then there are some places to get free ones. Um, you can get free .me domains from Namecheap, um, and some other free .design domains. You can really have almost anything these days at the end of a domain, which is kind of cool. Um, the next step is to choose a tool. Um, there are lots of different ways of building uh, portfolios. We're going to talk about a couple of them. Um, they range from Behance, which requires no knowledge of code at all, um, up to building a fully coded out website. Up to you, up to sort of the types of projects you're doing, up to how much time you want to invest in making this thing, or do you just want to get stuff up there and out there. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about Adobe slash Behance. Um, Behance is an Adobe product, or it's owned by them. Um, and then I'm also going to talk about uh, another product called Adobe Portfolio, that if you have a Adobe Cloud account, you have an Adobe Portfolio already that's included in it with hosting, which is awesome. So let's see if we can get to these. So I will put them here because this is the screen we recorded. Fair enough. That should work. So real quick, if you haven't been to Behance before, uh, Behance is sort of like a social network for creatives. Um, it allows you to post things. It allows you to view other people's stuff. There's a whole system of like likes and appreciations, and you can actually keep a nice record of things. Um, if we just look at somebody's project here, um, so somebody's form a day, I guess they're doing a form a day. So just real simple, single image, uh, nothing terribly fancy. Let's see if we can find a more uh, complicated one, perhaps, if their website will work. It's been sticky lately. Um, but you can create a profile. Um, on your profile, you can put multiple projects. Uh, it's a pretty easy, simple drag and drop interface. Um, you can see number of views, so you get some basic statistics. Uh, you can put some information, work experience, etc. Um, you can add a lot of other sections as well. Um, one of the things as well with Behance is you can actually do work in progress as well, which is kind of cool. So if you're working on something and you just want to get it out there, that's one way of doing it. Um, but since Adobe purchased Behance, um, they have created this thing called Adobe Portfolio. Um, Mine is built on it, looks something like this. So I've got the same projects, which populate, cross-populate. So if you build it on your portfolio site, it crosses down to Behance. If you build it on Behance, it crosses up, which is kind of cool. Um, and it's actually a very easy interface to use, so I'm going to pull up. So this is actually the sort of build environment. Um, everything is basically drag and drop, buttons kind of deal. Um, if we want to manage content, I can turn certain projects on and off easily. So if I have more ones that I'm working on but I don't want to show yet, um, you can add as many pages as you want. So it has an unlimited page limit. Um, it has built-in things, uh, which are handy. 
uh, like forms, so you can easily put in a contact form uh, if you want them. Um, and it has some other kind of cool, simple things. Um, easy to add Google Analytics. You just drop in the code and you're off and running. Um, you can link it to domain names. Um, you can do some search optimization and all the little little images like up here as well, um, as well as doing password protection. So if you have certain projects that you, maybe you want to show, but you only want to show them to certain people, uh, you can actually put certain projects behind a password. Um, let's see. One of the really cool features of Adobe Portfolio See if I can actually just show it through their general website. Um, is it comes with a bunch of themes. Um, I think they have, you know, f a fair number, and they have little descriptions of each one. And what you can actually do is, once you have your portfolio built, I'm, I'm, this very well may break my website as I haven't really done this, but you should be able to completely swap layouts. <laughs> um, without having to change any of your content. Um, so if you feel like on Monday you want one layout and Tuesday you want a next one, costs you literally just seconds um, to swap it over. And so now, instead of being this, I now have this. Um, in terms of adding content into a into a project like this one. Uh, it's relatively simple. You just sort of edit page content and it allows you to drop it in. So if I wanted to add something below here, I can insert, let's see, what are my options? I think I can upload an image, text, spacing. I can actually link to Lightroom if you use Lightroom for photos. Um, or directly to your Adobe Cloud account if you're keeping content there. Um, you can also throw in various links. Yeah, Cloud, you can put in a photo grid, add a form, upload files. Um, and then it's easy to just sort of drag things around as well. So no code required, very simple, um, effectively free, sort of. Um, if you have your Adobe account, Behance is free anyway. But it gives you a lot of power for not much time, not much effort really, versus having to build a whole site from scratch. But it, you are sacrificing some control. Cool. So on that note, yeah, so it's $10. The cheapest plan they have is $10 a month, which gives you Photoshop and Lightroom and an Adobe portfolio. So not bad at all. Yes. Cool. Yeah, so University System of Georgia student pricing for Adobe Cloud. Yeah, you buy it as a yearly thing. I do something similar. Cool. So now, Phil's going to talk about slightly more complicated systems. <clears throat> okay, yeah, so the next set of tools are kind of like in the middle between coding your own and using an Adobe portfolio or some much less codes. So it's kind of like a middle where like you have you still have drag and drop, but you're allowed to also customize a bit and add your own code. Um, so the three main tools that people use, um, Squarespace and Wix are kind of the established ones. So most people, I imagine, have seen Squarespace sites and or have one. Um, Wix has also been around for a long time. And then Webflow is relatively new. It's probably like three years old. Um, and that's the one I'm going to be demoing because it's the most like advanced one. And if you kind of get the sense of Webflow, and if you want to go easier, you can go to Squarespace or Wix. Um, so I think it logged me out. How do I get to it, Nishant? You don't have the swipe desktop to <laughs> it. It has to swipe, but it's on the same thing. Yeah, OK. So hold on. I use three. Hold on. Oh, 
remember your passwords or your No, I use password generator, man, so that's why. I don't trust myself. Also security. Okay, cool. <laughs> uh, we did, but it locked us out, I guess, after a time. All right, so web flows are similar, uh, kind of, or that have templates available to you too. So like you can look at all these different, these are like example sites people build a web flow that kind of like showcase it off. Um, and like you can follow designers who work on it too. Um, but we can just go in, so this is like a demo project that they give, it's like the portfolio project they title it. So right off, the, oh. Right off the bat, you'll see there's a lot more going on compared to Adobe Portfolio, and that like you have a right bar and a side bar and a left bar. Um, but basically, like the base premise is the same. Like you can click here and be like, "What's up?" Um, but the nice things is that you have a little bit more. You have a lot more flexibility. Like you're not just stuck to this template. Like I can drag around, rearrange however I want these headers. Um, and like if you look on the right here, there's a lot of different uh, stuff you can edit. So you can edit type, you can edit the weights of the type, and then like you can set CSS classes. So if you know a little bit of CSS, you can bring it in here. You can use also utilize your HTML. Um, also the neat thing is that they have like built-in interactions. So like you could have it fade in when they scroll to it. So like if we go back and we preview it, now that thing should fade. So now it fades in when we scroll to it. So you can have a little bit of flare. Um, and that's all pre-built which is cool. Um, let's see. So like basically it exposes all the CSS rules you might know, but on a GUI, so it might be a little bit more helpful for you to picture it out. Um, I don't know, what do you want to do to this site? We can add box shadows. Everyone loves box shadows nowadays. So we could add like a drop shadow. You can see it's there, and then if we go in, you can turn toggle it on and off. So you can see that box shadow I just added, and like here, I'm able to edit like the blur. So if I want to like blurrier, a little bit offset to be like slanted off, there's some light, minimize the size, and now it looks straight from Dribble. Um, yeah. So nice thing is about Webflow is that basically you have more power. Um, but you don't have to dive into the code itself. Any questions specifically off of this? Yeah, so um, I'll go over the pricings on the next slide. Um, basically, the way it's divided so Squarespace is 12 bucks a month if you buy it for the year, um, and they throw in a domain name. I don't know, I think it's a .com domain name. I don't know if you get to pick like what it ends with or like what you're limited to, because I don't use Squarespace. Um, but if you pay Squarespace monthly, it's $16 like a month without the domain name. Webflow is $12 a month. Um, that's also like a year upfront cost. And they have some cap where like you can only get 25,000 monthly visits, so like only 25,000 people can visit your site. I don't know why. It's like, but like realistically, will your site get 25,000 visits on your portfolio? Probably not. Um, and then Wix is ten dollars a month, but they have this throttling bandwidth where, like, it's like they throttle how fast the data gets to the person who's viewing your site. So, like, if you have a image heavy or video heavy, it might take a while to load because of that throttle. Yes. Oh yeah. So like, if you up here there are these buttons, and you can see you can preview it on all mobile, like landscape, tablet, desktop, and you can edit it around. So like, let's say on tablet. I don't know, we want section heading to be down here or something. Oh, okay. Well, basically, yeah, you can design responsibly. I don't know how to specifically set up based on like that to move that. I don't use Webflow professionally. 
I code my own site. So I don't know if I was the right person to do case this. But yeah, you can make a responsive using those previews on top. And like this is just a template. Like you could pick another template if you wanted to have available. Or you, the nice thing about this is you could literally start from scratch and create your own. Yeah, Adobe Portfolio is fully responsive as well. Yeah, I think everything we're going to show is fully responsive. Um, but here's like an example of all the elements they have. So they have layout elements. Like you could add a section all the way, a container, specifically hold something, um, lists, buttons, links, paragraphs, basically anything you would imagine. Navigation, a light box link. So like, you know, if you click the image, it pops up with a light box. You can scroll through the carousel in front, like the modal in front of your content. Yeah. So try it out. Try out Squarespace or Wix if you kind of want to have a little bit more control. Yeah. Yeah, but it has ads on it, which when you send it out, it seems very unprofessional to have ads on your portfolio. Yeah, it's it's five dollars a month for no ads, but there's still some other pretty like you can't also have a custom domain name. Like if you do that, the the, the cheapest plan for a custom domain is ten dollars with no ads. Five dollars buys you no ads, but you still on like whatever Rachel.weebly.com, which is like still very not great. Okay, cool. And then I'll hand it off to Nishant. Cool. How many people would like to code their websites? <laughs> okay. So I'm gonna I'm not gonna code React, but just kind of basic developer tools, uh what you can and cannot do. Uh not cannot do, but it's more like the general workflow. So most developers like try to use Sublime offline for like development. And uh, so once we get through it, so I will try to explain first like Bootstrap. So right now I will present to you Bootstrap. I mean Bootstrap is one of the most uh, used open source front end library. And it has like grids and existing components. And even if we go to their website, you can see that. Okay, so you can install them, or they have their CDN, so you can directly use their uh, the Bootstrap JS and CSS files. You don't need to have them. And then in the documentation, it's like pretty exhaustive. Uh, they have all the documentation about oh, what, how can you layout or structure, uh, what kind of content do you want to use if you want to present a code. Sure, uh, absolutely. <laughs> Probably, I can hold it. Can you hear me? Awesome. <laughs> uh, so, Bootstrap is like open source uh, front-end library. It allows you to get, uh, like, it gets you access to different components, grids, layout, structures, and uh, you can just go to their website in the documentation. It's pretty simple and how you can customize any website. So right now for demo, uh, what we can do is, oh, so one more thing about Bootstrap, they also have uh, a lot of templates. So you, if, you, if you are confident enough to, like, start from scratch, good. If you are not, probably you can like you can look up for like free templates, or you can pay for some ones, and you can get a like really cool uh, already made templates. So if I want to like give you a demo right now, if I select this kind of uh, so this is one of the Bootstrap templates already, uh, and I have already downloaded it. Uh, it should be up. Uh, so it is here. So this is how it is running. So if you see, like this is like a local web page right now. I just downloaded it, uh, and it's good to go. And you can have access to its code, and basically you can edit whatever you want on the website. And you have access over whatever CSS files they are using, JS files they are using, what kind of resources they have. And uh, 
probably it's yours uh, you can do whatever you want with it the next page is about version control so I will uh, strongly recommend using a version control uh, like Git for for your portfolio websites because when you are developing it there will be a lot of occasions when you will break your website or make some changes that you don't know what happened and it just breaks and if it's a season when your applications are going on and you have like a lot of visitors coming in you don't want that to happen so having Git and version control is one of the best ways to like identify or debug your bugs and at the same time like roll back to your previous versions for what it is working and github is like one of the best places to like it's an online tool for uh, keeping a track of all your github uh, one thing very cool about github is github pages uh, so github pages is a feature that github provides where if you have your entire repository of website you can directly use github to host your website so you don't have to buy like an additional hosting space along with domain name and then go there and set up your file structure website upload each time you just have it on github and it's sorted and it's as simple as you have to create like a git repository with your username so it looks something like this so if i want to have it up so the the git repo name should be like my username uh, and then .github.io and once it is up there um, so whatever you put in this so this link particularly nishanpanchal92.github.io will be publicly available so for example if I so for this interactive prototype I already have that interactive prototype up here so if you can see like this is a public URL and I can just open uh, the in, like its content anywhere so this is just like a prototype that I was running and testing with users, so I had it up there. Uh, so how do we integrate with our website? So right now we just downloaded this template. Uh, the next step would be uh, we download this template, we have our GitHub repo set up. The next immediate step will be to like clone the Git repo. And cloning is quite simple. Just go here, copy this, and then you can hit like, like git clone and the repo. And once you hit that, it will just like clone the entire repo, which I've already done. So, uh, where is that? It is here. So, I've already cloned my repo, so I have all this stuff here. Uh, what you can simply do is once you have your the website you downloaded, you can just copy paste the entire folder in the in the repo. And once that repo is done, all you need to do is to push all the changes uh, to push all the changes to that repo. And that is as so. For example, what I can do right now is I already have all of that set up. So for example, this is the website that we were looking at. Let me make sure if it is the right website I've opened. Uh, I miss it CI index. I can just customize a couple of things like I don't like the start bootstrap and welcome signs. So what I can do is instead of start bootstrap I can have my own name and uh, inside of instead of our studio I will just change it to my portfolio and save the file just hit refresh and you see that these things are changed so it now says my website welcome to my portfolio but it is still on my local file how do i push that to github so once i go to the gate i can just check what is the status of the git repo and it will say okay there were some changes in these two files that i need to like still push so you can simply add that for committing so is it ci and then you can commit the changes locally first uh, like content so whenever you're committing you are required to give a message and then you just have to like push it to your github repo 
So once it is pushed, so the changes you made right now are being pushed to your GitHub repo online. And as soon as they are pushed, I can directly access them. Uh, so this was the, so if you see like this is the website running on my GitHub repo, which is available to everyone. And if I just refresh it, yeah, so it just changes. So as soon as you made some changes offline on your machine, you can just push it to your GitHub repo and it's already available to everyone. And the link that you see like github.io is publicly accessible so you can share it with anyone you want. Uh, the next step is one, if you want to give it like a custom domain, uh, because generally I bought like nishan.design and I want people to be referred to this website uh, when I use nishan.design. So Phil told me about it, like you can use a CNAME file uh, inside your Git repo. Uh, something, I think I have your stuff over here. And the CNAME file can only have your uh, domain name. And then what is the next step? You need to like add this domain name into the DNS uh, of your, from wherever you buy your domain, you just need to add that file here. And then it, it should refer back to the website. Uh, on the other hand, if you guys don't want to use GitHub for hosting, and if you think you already have like a separate hosting website, I will still recommend using GitHub. Uh, for example, like this is my portfolio website, it is separate from github.io. Uh, what you can do is you have, I used like this website for hosting, and you can sync up your GitHub, you can set up your GitHub master branch on this. So every time you don't need to manage your like file structure and upload separate files, you can just come here, deploy the file, uh, deploy the Git repo, and whatever changes you uploaded to Git repo will be applied to your website as well, and it is as good as go. So regardless of what method of hosting you use, it is always good to have like a, uh, always GitHub up and running. Uh, so any questions related to that, uh, anything? A uh, domain name, uh, you can, there, there are a lot of websites, a few that we already mentioned are Namecheap and Hover. So, uh, when you set up your files, can they always come to this, like, so... When, when it will expire? Yeah, like, like, Sure. So, most of the domains, it's, it's up to you for how long you want to buy a domain name. I generally buy it for a year and after, when the year is ending, you have an option to stay with the same domain provider and like renew your domain. Or generally there are these kind of schemes where if you are switching your domain provider, they generally give you a better deal. Like if you buy your domain name for like $10 a year and by the end of it, you are trying to switch to, you bought it from Namecheap, probably you want a better deal. Namecheap is giving you like renewal for like $15. But if you plan to like switch to some other uh, website like GoDaddy, then GoDaddy will give you like, oh, you come to us and we'll give you like two years worth of domain name for $10. So you can always explore those kind of scheme. If you like their service, you can stay with them or you can switch to another person, uh, another provider, but uh, it, you always have to renew them. I mean, that's how it is. If you don't want to, you can probably buy it for 10 years if you are happy with your domain name. Uh, Hover, has, that works. Hover usually has deals for new signups, um, and I think your, they like your first renewal, they'll let you do two years, and then after that, they'll let you do like 10 or more. So if it's like your name, you can hang on to it. Exactly. I don't like my domain name, I might switch. <laughs> uh, you can own multiple domain names po pointing to the same server. So you don't want to give in, that's fine as well. Uh, so the next thing is about tracking your data. So in the presentation, we spoke a little about uh, Google Analytics and uh, you should always have it. But I will go a little into how is it useful. So Google Analytics generally is good if you want to see a uh, number of visitors to your website and particular pages, what are the flows, uh, where does the audience belong. So this is how, uh, okay. So this, is, so this is like the tracking for my website. Uh, I generally come here to see uh, like 
uh, my audience overview okay like over a period of the from september 1st to up till now how many people have already arrived on my website uh, total users total sessions and page views what is the average session duration uh, bounce rate is about how many people came to your website uh, just scroll through did not interact and they switched over they did not continue with your website and bounce rate can be is for website and not for specific pages uh, then it can be new sessions versus old sessions returning users versus new visitors uh, and then you can see like the language of the users what country do they belong to what cities were the hits from uh, what browsers they were using what kind of operating system they were using uh, generally the service provider is useful if you want to sometimes you get to know what company they belong to like people who are from Georgia Tech or at and or in this case Allegheny College uh, so those kind those information is sometimes useful when you are applying uh, you can try to predict like oh if I apply to these, these these companies who are in these locations so probably they are trying to access my website because a hit came from a particular city or a particular domain similarly audiences uh, more thing you can go and see is um, technology you can also uh, I think so see of how many people are using mobile versus uh, desktops because that will also determine to see if you are uploading a new project how important it is to make sure that it looks good on mobile as well as desktop if you think there are not many visitors from mobile you can try and scrape that plan I mean you cannot you can care less uh, but it is a good uh, like it is good to have all the information okay. Hmm. So the the. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Uh, next thing good about uh, Google Analytics is behavior flow. So here you see where people land. So I see that most people land on my index pages first. That is my landing page, and some people use direct links to projects. And once they have those direct links, where do they go? So once a person comes to a particular project, he remains on that project and where do most people drop off? Like most people drop off for me looking at my landing page. And then you can think more about, oh, why is that happening? Are people not understanding or not? Are they are not curious enough? And then you can try changing some small things. Uh, one, one again more important thing I would say to check is uh, all pages drill down. And here you see uh, what most people are looking at, uh, which project. So here I can clearly see like Notify VR, DuckTab, and Fresh Market are the top three projects that most people look into. Uh, and then I see like how many people are visiting that and how many people are staying there. Uh, one interesting thing that everyone should keep a track of is the site speed. Uh, so generally when we are making our portfolios we forget that we always want high resolution images and like HD videos on our website but that comes at a cost because once you upload those kind of heavy images and heavy websites uh, it really impacts the performance and performance is like a very important factor for, for UX portfolios because imagine a recruiter who is going through a list of like 700 interviewers and they have to select a few they won't have much time for to spend on your website and if they load your website and it takes like 10 seconds to load an image or 10 seconds for the content they will just skip it they will not see it uh, so that's why it's important to see uh, if your website is performing well in terms of time and resources uh, so if I just switch to page timings so this generally tells me like how much time what is the average loading time for my website and different web pages and sometimes it reveals a clear indication that some pages have issues 
because right now I clearly see so my average time is 7.74 seconds out of which all other website all other web pages all my projects are like 100% less than that that is they take around 3 to 3.5 seconds but this project notify VR takes 100 times more means it almost takes 14 seconds to load which is a issue and uh, you can use these statistics to realize like which project pages would have impact or require more optimization in terms of resources that you are making it available on that web page. So, yeah, so anything about Google Analytics that you guys are curious about or something you find confusing or interested in knowing more? Yes. Uh, so in that, all you need to do, so to set up, basically you need to get a token first and in Adobe portfolio, you just need to pick up that token and copy paste. That's it. And you, you are sorted. So yeah, Google Analytics has integration with almost every tool uh, since they are widely used. Uh, in addition to this, I also use something called Heap Analytics. So this is more towards a very fine grain control over tracking. This is uh, if you are interested in doing then you can go into it because it gives you like raw events like what people clicked on which element they clicked on and you can see oh on this page he clicked on a text on this target so it's more towards understanding a user behavior for oh are they expecting some images or some buttons to be clicked and if then then you can try like fine graining those and try to convert those into links and like maybe have some actions on those so this is optional, you don't have to do it, but it's just what I like to do. So, uh, so Google Analytics, Heap Analytics. And next thing is just additional tips. Uh, so these tips are for generally applied to everyone. So the first thing is, uh, as I mentioned, that keep the images and video files compressed. Uh, it's really important to keep your website really optimized and fast. Uh, and that's why you can compress these images like very simply using Photoshop or tiny PNG or Handbrake. Handbrake is actually for videos uh, and tiny PNG is for images. So you can just go there, upload it, you will get a compressed file, just put it on your portfolio. The second thing is uh, if it is possible, uh, if you have many resources, initially it should be fine if you are hosting at a single place, all the resources should be small and everything is loading fine. But as the number of projects grow, uh, there might be a stage where everything is being loaded only from one server space. And sometimes that becomes a bottleneck, uh, especially if uh, there are some kind of bandwidth uh, restrictions from your hosting provider. So it is also a good option to have these resources like videos, uh, just put them on YouTube, have it linked. Uh, for images, you can upload them to Dropbox or Box.com or OneDrive and only have their links linked into your website. So you don't have to have the actual resources on your website or on your server, but you can only have those links embedded. So you are hosting less stuff. Again, uh, for all the portfolios, try to embed like interactive prototypes wherever possible. That is really impactful and allows like people who are seeing it or the interviewers and the designers to like see what is actually being done. And most of the tools like Envision, Marvel, uh, Framer, and I'm sure there are many more that allows you to like embed interactive prototypes on your website. Uh, any questions on these? Awesome. Uh, by that, we would like to conclude and say thank you very much for attending. And at the same time, any questions regarding portfolios? And it can be anything that is not being covered. So, anything. Yeah. Uh, you the Why you want to answer that? Yeah. Um, when it comes to showing IRB, non IRB stuff, um, the big kind of or the easiest way to handle it is cut out specifics. Um, you can talk about findings, but not show specific numbers or specific statistics from individuals. 
Um, one of the big things with IRB is just um, privacy, really, so that you're not disclosing information about people. Um, I would sort of say use discretion. Um, but you, you might say something that, you know, from conducted surveys, um, we discovered that more of our users like McDonald's than Burger King without saying, you know, here's the results of our survey with what favorite places people like and things of that nature. Um, if you can, get the IRB. It's always sort of the safest way to go. Uh, but it, it's totally possible that, you know, there are a lot of projects out there that are not IRB and are certified. But just be considerate of the users that you're you know, presenting their information with. And you could probably ask the IRB office and they give you a more official answer. But from a personal experience, uh, I would also recommend go and talk with professors because sometimes we think we require an IRB, but we really don't. Uh, so there are, there are a lot of occasions where, especially for my project, where we thought we required IRB, but we spoke with Professor Gary Bruce and she told that for this stuff you don't, and you can go ahead and put that on your website. So you can make sure to like just check with the professors. They even they like they are not officially like talking to IRB, but they have good idea about what comes under IRB and what doesn't. So you can talk to the professors here. Yeah. Any other questions? Hosting and server, yes. 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 Awesome. In that case, thank you very much again for coming and officially over. Have a good day. Okay.